Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. What a beautiful story about the widow of Nain. What a wonderful story. And just on its own merits, just externally, just the, the basic meaning of the story is, is really amazing. How much God loves us and how he delivered this widow from a life of sorrow and of penury. Because she, without a son, without a husband, she was going to starve. So it's beautiful on, on its own merits. But there's a deep teaching in this story about how we are to live our life. It's really an instructional manual. All of the gospel is. That's why I'm always telling you to read the gospel every day. Because if you read the gospel, you really learn what's true in life, what's false, how to recognize the difference. You, rec you see people that are worthy of emulation, and especially our Lord Jesus Christ, because that's what you're supposed to be doing now. You're supposed to be imitating Christ. And you also see people that are doing bad things, and, and you can see maybe things that relate to you, that you can teach you to uh, avoid some of those pitfalls. So you should be reading the Gospels all the time. But I would say the major reason to read the Gospels is that they're beautiful and they're wonderful. And we need beauty in our life. Because when we have beauty, when we experience God in the Gospels, then we're strengthened for everything else that is happening in our life. So yes, there's theological things we learn, there's moral admonitions, there's commandments, there's uh, what I'm going to do today is kind of give you a mnemonic for how to live your life, how to approach God, how to deal with everything. There's all that. But really, you should have a sense of wonderment in reading the Gospels. If only people were to love the Gospels as much as they love their favorite television program or anime or something. You know, there are people that are addicted to anime. They don't read the Gospels. There are people who watch a lot of TV. They don't read the Gospels or other such things. A lot of us have highly developed thumbs, and we shouldn't because we're addicted to our phones. We should be reading the Gospels. So this little, I didn't intend to do this little diatribe, but I pretty much almost do every time, don't I? It's so important to read the Gospels because there's life in them. Jesus Christ is in the Gospels and you learn how to be a human being by reading the Gospels. So here we have how to be a human being in this story about the widow of Nain. So the external parts of the story are really pretty simple. He's going into a city. He comes near the city gate. At the city gate, a woman is being part of a funeral procession for her only son who is laying dead on the funeral bier. And then he stops the beer, touches it. Then he says, I say to thee, I rise. The man gets up and starts talking. Everyone is amazed. A simple story. You can tell, like an elevator story, right? You could tell it before somebody gets to the next floor. But let's look at the deep meaning here. The deep and beautiful meaning. So, he comes to the city at the gate. There was a dead man carried the only son of his mother, and she was a widow. There's a lot of death in this world, isn't there? There's a lot of death in us, isn't there? There's life in us, but there's also death in us, isn't there? The things we say and do, the th people, the things we are, the, the ideas we have, how we relate to situations. Sometimes we relate to situations in a, more that's, in a way that's more dead than alive. So there's a lot of death. There's not just dead people meaning that they died of some medical condition or old age or heart attack or something. But there's also deadness in our souls. There's a lot of death in the world. And the Lord's aware of this death. He's aware of the death that's in you. And you hopefully are aware of some of that as well. And you beg the Lord to help you with those things. So there's a dead man. And the Lord sees him and has compassion on him. This is not superfluous. He has compassion on him. Well, certainly, if he stopped him, he must have had compassion. But the evangelist goes out of his way to say he had compassion on him. It reminds me of the parable of the prodigal, excuse me, 
Yes, the prodigal son. The Lord is traveling. The Samaritan is the Lord now in this parable. And he's traveling to the man and has compassion on him. So the Lord doesn't really have compassion in a uh, random way. It's not like he just is walking about and he sees someone and is compassionate. That's how it happens with us, right? You might see someone in some situation and you have compassion on them. But you didn't know that they'd be there before. But they were there and you, your paths crossed and you had compassion. It's not like that with our Lord. <laughs> our Lord doesn't accidentally pass, uh, cross paths with us. Our Lord walks alongside us, all of us. So he's always compassionate about our needs, about the deadness, shall we say, that's within us. And this is not super, superfluous to believe and to, to talk about because many times people feel alone in the world. They, they feel sort of abandoned. And they might not say that they feel abandoned by God, but their practices show that that's the way they're acting. So if a person has some tough time, and oh, invariably it happens to us. It happens to all of us, doesn't it? So something really hard in our life, and we find that, well, after, at the end of the week, we barely prayed. Oftentimes when things are really hard for us, emotionally, we pray very little. Well, the Lord has compassion on us. And we don't feel his compassion. So we don't reach out to him because we're in a all, all in a flux, you know, all, all just at loose ends. But the Lord is always present, so we should remember this. So this little detail that the Lord had compassion is important. Then he stopped the beer and he touched it. And of course, this is an indication, according to the fathers, how much he loves our human nature. He became human like us. Of course, then he transformed that humanity to something that is unlike us, that we are to become. He loves us that much. I've told you many times in this sermon, I always seem to refer to the sweet kissing icon, that beautiful icon where Christ is kissing the cheek of the Theotokos, showing how much he loves humanity. So he touched the beer because he loves us, to show that he loves us. Because he could have just said, without touching the beer, that for the man to arise. Also, this is an indication that the Lord is above everything and can do anything. To touch a dead body was to make yourself unclean. Well, the Lord is a priest, isn't he? High priest. And yet he touched the beer and was not unclean because he makes all things clean. So there's a, a, many meanings to why he touched the beer. Then he said uh, to the woman, weep not. It's peculiar, isn't it? A woman has just lost her son. She obviously doesn't have a husband. She's going to be alone in the world. And he says, weep not. Perhaps there were some people that thought, how dare he talk like that? And then, of course, he says, I say to the young man, arise, and he gets up. So let's go through a little bit of this, uh, how this becomes a mnemonic for how to interact with God, how to interact with everything in your life. So it's a progression. So the, there's dead things in our life. The Lord touches the beer, touches us, and he says, weep not. Now, we are to not weep because we are in expectation of what is going to happen. We are in hoping, that is knowing, that something is going to happen that is good for us. It's not good right now, but it will be good later. So why should we waste our time weeping? We shouldn't. Now, I understand that there's human sadness, and we weep if we lose someone in, in death or something like that. Those are just emotions. But in terms of our spiritual nature, we shouldn't be weeping for the things that are problems in our life. We should be weeping for our sins, but not for the problems in our life. And then we should, he, the Lord touches the beer, which is indicating that we must have intimate contact with God, with prayer, reading, with, of course, prostrations, with awareness. And I just talked about that awareness a little bit. I hope you understood it, that 
if you read the Gospels with this expectation, you, you have this awareness of God filling everything in your life, this intimacy with him, that he's touching you and you're touching him. So you have this intimate awareness of God, that he's present in your life, no matter if things are good or bad, if they're hard, if they're easy, if you've sinned, if you're doing well that day. doesn't matter. God is with you, and he's present and touching you. And you must ever build this awareness of him being present. That's why, you know, I ask pretty much everybody in confession, are you reading? I don't get a whole lot of great answers, to be honest with you. And, and that bothers me because you have to be cultivating in your heart this continual awareness of the intimacy of God with you. He's intimate with you, but you have to be intimate with him. And if you're just going through life concerned about this and concerned about that, hardly ever reading the gospel, probably never reading the Psalter, just, you know, rushing through prayers, then there's not intimacy. You've got to have intimacy. It's very critically important. So he touches the beer. He says, stand still. They stand still. This is very important. I kind of glossed over that uh, when I gave the description. So the, the, the actual chronology is the Lord says, weep not. Then he touches the beer and everybody stands still. Well, it makes sense they'll stand still because he's, he's stopping the beer from moving. So what are you going to do? You're just going to stand still unless you're going to push against him and cause a ruckus. So everybody's standing still. And when they stood still, it was quiet because there was expectation. And then the Lord said, I say to you, the young man, arise. The man could hear because things were still. It was very important to be still. Super important to be still. The stillness is in our, our intense prayer. If your prayer is just rattled off or listened to in the car, or, you know, you shorten it because, well, you know, you were up too late, or whatever, then you're not standing still. Now, certainly, we should pray in moments when things are hectic, you know, and if you have a lot to do that morning, and you, you had a lot to do the previous night, and you're tired, okay, you can't stand for an hour of still prayer, but that should not be the rule. It should be the exception. You have to learn to stand still. That's why the Jesus prayer is so important. Because in saying the Jesus prayer, you're standing still. I mean, you not be, might not be physically standing still. I often walk when I say it. But it's a way of trying to quiet your heart and just listening to God by saying the Jesus prayer, saying most holy theotokos, etc. Prostrations are a way of standing still. There's a lot of movement, but it's really a way of standing still as well. Because you're, you're making yourself available. You're listening to God. Here God has touched the beer, and you're laying on the beer. You're sort of half dead, aren't you? You're like the, you're, uh, uh, did I say prodigal son before? It was, it was good Samaritan, isn't it? Excuse me, when I told you about the parable. It's the parable of the Samaritan that I told you about. So in this way, I'm just like St. John Chrysostom, you know, because he made about five mistakes in all of his, all of his preaching. <laughs> when he misquoted scripture. So look at that, I, I misquoted something. That's the only similarity that I can think of. So the, the Samaritan, the, the, the uh, man by the side of the road, he was half dead, wasn't he? He was half dead. So I think we're more half dead. We're never all the way dead. There's things in us that are, are, are dark and God is reaching into those dark places, but we're becoming more alive. We shouldn't be saying we're dead. Because we're not dead, we're alive. But there's parts of us that are not responding well yet. And so, if we stand still, God will teach us about those things. And will enlighten us. And will help us with all of these things. And he will say to us, I say to thee, arise. God can do everything just simply. He spoke and there was light. He said to Lazarus, arise, and he did. He rose from the dead without saying anything, I'm sure. God can do anything. And yet we're in our problems and we think everything's so tough, so hard. It's not so tough and hard. God can do anything. If we are standing still to hear, 
I've told you this illustration many times, and I'll, I'll have to say it again. I'm sorry for the repetition, but it's, it's just left an indelible imprint in my, in my mind, coming from a dear friend who had too much noise in his head, unfortunately. And he said, it's really hard to hear a conversation when there's a, a railroad train going through your head. It is. I used to, when I worked at a certain company, I'd go walking out by the railroad tracks uh, for lunch. And I, the train would come by once in a while. And I would stand near the train and, and so I could feel its wind and hear it. it. The conductor didn't like that. He was always very mad looking at me. He'd honk his horn and stuff, but what can he do, you know? I mean, he wouldn't be able to stop anyway if I were on the tracks. But uh, it's loud. It's super loud. It's so loud, I would literally sometimes would shout and couldn't hear myself. So if there's a railroad train going through your, tr through your brain, you can't hear anything. You've got to learn to stand still. We don't do a whole lot of that anymore, do we? Uh, in the old days, I suppose there was some standing still. We're a more agrarian economy at such. There was more time. Uh, imagine that you, know, you couldn't get in contact with anybody any second of the day or look up something any second of the day. You couldn't be in the woods and have your phone ring. <laughs> uh, it was an easier day in some ways. But you can recapture much of that by learning to stand still in your prayer. And not just in your prayer, but in your overall Attitude. Somebody was asking me about what does it mean to be to pray in Christ, you know, in the name of Christ. For some people, that's a formula, but what it actually is is a disposition. But you're always in Christ. You're always of Christ. You're always emulating Christ. You're always aware of Christ touching you intimately, so you touch Him back intimately. You're always aware of all these things. That's praying in the name of Christ. And then when you pray, then, you'll pray for things that are according to Christ. You won't pray for things that are false and fleeting and even damaging. And if you do, well, then the Lord will, uh, he won't give you those things because they would be bad for you. So this is the way to approach life. First of all, do what I tell you. Read the gospel every day. And read it with expectation. Read it with um, a sense of wonderment. And uh, if we can only be like children. Just recently, uh, I took uh, some, of my, uh, some of my boys to, the, uh, to a farm to baptize two children. This was a while ago, actually. And uh, they got to ride on farm equipment, tractors and everything. And the thing that they liked the best <laughs> was being on the Ranger, which is like a all-terrain, you know, one of those small utility pickup trucks that are used for farming and stuff like that, four-wheel drive and such. Just getting in that and driving on the roads and going fast and feeling the wind in their hair, they, that was their favorite thing. Oh, to be like a child, to be excited about the gospel, like they were excited about riding on the Ranger. Wouldn't that be beautiful to be that excited? To read the gospel and to be just inflamed with excitement and love that day and have it carry you through the rest of your day. Wouldn't that be wonderful? You can do that. And then what you're doing is you're interacting with God as he's touching your beer. And he is then, when you're ready, saying to you in a quiet, still voice, the kind that Elijah heard, I say to thee, arise. That problem you have, it's going to be okay. I'm going to fix it. And you're going to hear him. And you're going to believe him. And then you're going to be excited about reading the gospel the next day. It's a beautiful life if we, if we dare to live it. So may God help us to have this kind of life. To foster intimacy with our, our Lord. To feel him in our life. To come to him and, and ask him for help. To be still to hear his answer. And to be alive in Christ. God bless you.